content. Amen. If you'd be so good, take out your sermon notes and your pen from your service guide, or you can follow them along on your, your cell phone or, or using the version app. And today, uh, for those of you that don't know, we've been in this thing where we, uh, our, our church for this year, we're calling it the year of the word. We've always preached God's word, but we decided this was going to be a year where we go a little bit deeper and we're going to start learning some of the great doctrines of the church. And so here's where you and I get to pick up now. Last, uh, last month we talked about God's word and how to get to know God. And here's where we're going to be going over these next couple of weeks. We're going to learn more about God's church. Okay, and uh, you're going to today, if you're a history buff, you're going to love, uh, uh, love today. If you're not a history buff, it'll be much better next week. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, but whenever uh, whenever I've talked with people, uh, I'm, I'm 20 plus years in full time ministry now. And my family uh, oftentimes have some of the greatest definitions of what a church is. You know, I, I remember one time this guy was talking to me, he goes, you know what, I'll tell you. Uh, every summer we go down and we have church at the lake and I'm like, what? It's like, yeah, man, we just go and we, we enjoy God's creation and, 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 and we just have church and I'm like, yeah, there ain't no church. There's just some dudes at the lake, you know? And, and I'm like, well, and then one guy would tell me, let me tell you where my, my church is. It's in that deer stand, baby. I'm there, and I feel the Holy Ghost, especially whenever Mr. Uh, Fuzzy Tail walks out there. And, I go, and, and I'm like, yes, you can enjoy God's creation, and you can enjoy that, but, but that's, that's not a church, all right? There are so many different definitions for so many people where here's what we've got to understand uh, something. Is that you and I, we can be a Christian alone, but we can't be a church alone. All right, uh, and today I'm going to show you the very first time in Scripture that the word church is ever is ever used, where you and I can begin to see, you know what, this is how God created us to be. All right, I, I've seen so many horrible definitions of of what church is. Whenever I was a little boy, if you asked me what what a church was, um, I, I had one word for you. Boring, <laughs> and, and some people be like, you know, it's it's down that road over there. You know, it's it's down now Highway 60, 64. We have got so many nicknames at our church. They're like, oh, dude, the Splash Pad Church. Oh yeah, man, I've heard all about it. Or uh, y'all the church that uh, one one of my favorite. Y'all that church that done the circus, aren't you? <laughs> like, yeah, we we are. And so here's where where you and I have to understand that God has a specific purpose and a specific definition. For what a church is. I, I remember as a young man, I read a quote from a guy by the name of Dr. Miles Monroe that absolutely changed my life. And he said this, where the purpose is unknown, abuse is inevitable. You know what? That applies to every area of our life. If you don't know what the purpose of marriage is, you'll never invest in it. You will always operate on what your definition of it is. And then most likely you're going to screw it up if it's not God's definition. So today, let's see the very first time you, we ever see the word, uh, word church mentioned. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 16. If you, if you don't, it's totally cool. We have all the, all the scriptures on the screen. Let me give you the scenario here, all right? <clears throat> Jesus and his disciples are walking, and it's the furthest north they have ever walked from Judea. It's 25 miles. And, and rabbis understood the importance of environments, kind of like us. Like, we changed the graphics where you guys can be able to do this. We got lights where you can enjoy it, man. Uh, those guys who are watching online. By the way, um, I, I want to make sure you all know uh, some things that are happening this month. We are, we are making some major remodels in our church. Um, we're about to, uh, our drum cage should be in in a couple of weeks. For those of us, that it's, a, it's a little too loud and, and maybe the... Uh, uh, maybe the little uh, <laughs> the ear things don't necessarily work really good for you. We're going to be able to reduce that dramatically in the days ahead uh, to be able to give you the best experience. But rabbis learned the importance of experience. And so Jesus says, hey, guys, I want you all to, to follow me. And, I wanna, uh, and, and uh, uh, we're going to go talk for a little while. And so they keep walking and walking. And they go to this place called Caesarea Philippi. And if you know anything about the history of Caesarea Philippi, no good little Jewish boy would ever go there, ever, for any reason. Some of you are like, why? Uh, Caesarea Philippi, at this time, was the world headquarters for the goat god Pan, okay? 
And so people traveled all over the world. If they were goat worshipers, they were like, man, you got to go to Caesarea Philippi. That's a world headquarters. So and they would go and they would worship in Caesarea Philippi on the, this, this huge mountain. All right. And in that mountain, you're going to see some pictures of this. In that mountain, there was this crack. All right. See this? This is a Caesarea Philippi. In that little crack, there would, they would go in and they would have these festivals where they worship the goat god Pan. And, and they would go in there. And if there's any young kids in the audience, we're kind of PG-13 here. And let me dress this up. In the, inside the mountain, they would get up close and personal with goats. Okay? Use your own imagination for what that means. All right? But they were there. And here was the thing. With all, the, all these little Jewish church boys, are, they're, like, they're like, surely to God. We're not going there. And they kept getting closer there. And finally, they'd look at each other like, when mom and dad hears about this, they are going to freak. All right? It's because you didn't go and hang out where there was idols. And so inside that mountain, it was called, uh, that little crack, it was called the Gates of Hades. All right? Because all kind of hellish behavior happened. And once they get there, Jesus, with this backdrop behind him, he looks at me and goes, it says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi in verse 13, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, or some say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or, or one of the prophets. But Jesus looks at him and he says, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? And can I let you know something? That's a fair question for all of us today. Because sometimes people, a lot of people that don't know really who Jesus is, everybody will kind of acquiesce and they'll say, well, he was a great teacher. But if you look at that, that's an intellectually honest answer to that. Because if you really look at who Jesus Christ and who he claimed to be, you can come to one of three conclusions. Either this, number one, he was a liar, all right? We're like, man, this guy claimed to be the son of God, God himself on the earth. And so, but there's only one problem. In all of the words that he's ever said that's recorded, nobody can ever find a a lie that he told. So you can't can't rule that. And then the other side to it is, all right, this dude was a lunatic. I mean, what kind of guy said that he's God here on earth? And, and, but you can't, you can't look all throughout history and you never see any lunatic behavior. So you got to cancel that out. Josh McDowell said that Jesus is one of three people. He's either a liar, a lunatic, or he's Lord. And this is where you and I, we, as we examine the scriptures, we see that he's the Lord, uh, the Lord, very God that created the earth. And so he asked him, who do you say that I am? And Peter, the most outspoken of all the disciples, of whom I have been compared to regularly, Simon Peter answered, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Are you understanding the significance of what he's saying? Hey, look, I know there's all kinds of despicable stuff going on in the world. I understand that there's a whole lot of people that are worshiping the wrong God, but these are not the people that I've come on earth to shun. These are the people that I've come to this world to reach. If you're here today and you got all kinds of issues, I want to go ahead and take the mystery out of it, honey. You are standing around people who have out you 10 to 1. Because if you're here and you've got kind of a bad taste in your mouth about church, what I invite you to do is join us and learn to rediscover what church is. Because Jesus describes exactly what this is. He uses the word here. And what he says, he says, Peter, I like you. You know why? Because you're bold and aggressive. And I love that declaration. And on that declaration, that uh, rock of revelation, I'm going to build my church. And the word that Jesus uses for church here is the word ecclesia, okay? And here's what's so cool. It's not a religious term at all. And so Jesus, the first time the word church is ever used, nobody, uh, although it's the first time uh, the word's ever used in Scripture, nobody asked what a church was. You know why? Because they knew what a church was. An ecclesia in Jesus' day was this, right? Uh, It says, a group of people called together for a specific purpose. 
Did you notice it wasn't a place, it wasn't a building, it wasn't an institution or organization? And don't get me wrong, these are the things are necessary, but can I let you know, let me take the mystery out of it. There ain't going to be any prizes in heaven for the most beautiful building. <laughs> Jesus didn't go look at the, oh man, that national cathedral. Thank you, guys. You know, that's not who it is. Because the best description of the word ecclesia, I want you to write this down. The best word to describe the word ecclesia or church in the Bible is the word movement. Yeah, you and I, we got to organize and have a meeting place, but we have to realize that the church that Jesus gave his life for is a movement first. The church is not a building that we go to or a service that we attend. It is a family that we belong to and a movement that we are a part of. And God, the God of the Bible, is always looking for people who will move with him. You see, what did Jesus say to all of his disciples? He said, come, follow me. In other words, come move with me. Follow me. I'm going to take you. I'm going to show you some things you never saw before in your life. And here's the thing. The reason why there are gates, uh, why Jesus talks about the gates of hell. and uh, Later on he says, I've got the keys to death, hell, and the grave. The reason why there's a gate around hell is because you and I, when we're a part of a movement, we're constantly plundering and stealing people out of hell. This is the movement of the church. This is what you and I should rediscover and learn to embrace when we learn to understand what God's church was designed to do. Let me tell you something. We'll lay down our life for it. We will sacrifice for it. We will understand what Jesus was talking about. You see, every time this church has ever decided to move, God moved with us. We were one time, we were meeting in a country club, the very first place we ever met. There were some of you that were a part of it. We had about 40 people on a regular basis. It was a Wednesday night Bible study when nobody else was doing, uh, doing a Wednesday night. Everybody was going, I said, hey, man, maybe let's just start having a Bible study to see what, what God will do. And in that Bible study, we dreamt together about what the church should look like. And said, man, wouldn't it be cool if... If there was a church where people who could come from all types of background, people that, you know, have never gone to church before in their life, or people that were disenfranchised with church, people who got hurt in a church, and all of a sudden they understood what the church was really about. And so in the future when they got their feelings hurt, they didn't have to leave because they understood what the purpose of a church was. By the way, can I tell you something about getting your feelings hurt in church? Your chances of getting hurt in this church are 100%. Let me take the mystery out of it for you. You know why? Because this church got a lot of people in it. And their chances of getting hurt here only gradually uh, increase. And there are so many times, by the way, we're going to be talking a lot about how not to be offended in church. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching good. But the reason why I'm going to talk to you about offense is this. Whatever it takes to offend us is all it takes to defeat us. And so we're going to be one of these people like, you know what? We got tough skin around here. We're going to keep on going because the movement's more important. Now watch this. We went from a country club to a school. We got property. And then one day we were noticing we were in four services. But I was like, God, what do you want us to do? I mean, we don't we ain't got like crazy money or anything like that. And then all of a sudden they were telling me, yes, a, a church down the road, they spent $9 million on their building. I was like, yeah, there ain't no way we can raise no $9 million. The money's come very slow here. And so uh, we found out that there was 150 people that were driving every week from Bay Manette. I said, we may not got no $9 million, but you know what? We can spend $800,000 and build them a church in Bay Manette because we want them to be able to uh, invite their friends to, uh, to church. And, and when people got to drive, they'll say, look, I'm sure your church is cool, but it ain't no 30 minutes one way drive cool. You know? And so we said, man, why not have a local presence there? Let me tell you what's happening every week at that church. We started that two, two years ago. That church is regularly seeing between 250 and 300 people every week. They're giving their life to Jesus in a town of 9,000. Let me tell you what the talk of the town is. It's Coastal Church Bay Manette. You know why? Because they decided a long time ago that we weren't going to be known for our religion. They decided a long time ago we are a movement and we're going to keep on multiplying because God has saved us so that we can go out and be a part of his movement and help resurrect what the church was born to be. Can I let you know, around 2015 we met together and we were running about 1,200 people and, and you know what? You guys said that's not enough and we needed to buy an auditorium. 
But you guys said, let's build a park instead. <laughs> you know, let's build a splash pad, even though we need to grow, we need another building and everything. And you built all of this thing here. And can I let you know what's happened since then? Three years ago, we decided we were going to matter in this community. And last January, this January, this past month, let me, let's brag on God really quick. Last January, this church averaged 1,934 people every weekend. Since that day, we decided to do that. We have seen 8,360 people give their lives to Jesus and 960 people water baptized all to the glory of God. God wants a church that will move with him. So let me give you a little history lesson real quick about how God always likes moving. In around 2067 BC, God spoke to a man named Abram, and he tells him to do something. He says this, Genesis 12, 1. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I'm going to show you. Tells him what to do. What's he saying to him? Abram, I need you to move with me. Uh, the reason why I need you to, to move, with, by the way, he's telling him, there ain't nothing for you here. I've got something better for you than this. I want to show you my promise for your life. And true to God's word, you know what's so cool about the God of the Bible? Every time he gives us a command, he always gives us a promise too. You know what? He says, look, I want you to do this. I'm going to be with you. He says this in verse 2. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. I will, and you will be a blessing. I'll bless those who curse you. And, I will, and, I, and I, whoever blesses you, I will bless them. And to all the people on the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord told him. Now watch this. God tells this man that he's going to, you know what? I'm going to use you to bless the world. Here's what's so cool. The setting that God tells him this, there ain't nobody around. And he's in the middle of a desert. So he said, can you imagine like, yeah, it had to be you, God. It had to be only Almighty God that could ever make this happen because I'm here alone in the desert like some rat. And here I, uh, okay, I'm going to do it. He obeys him. Here's the thing, that Abram, who later on changes his name to Abraham, which means the father of many nations, he becomes crazy rich, okay? He is known worldwide, and he had a family at an old age, okay? God fulfills every one of his words to him, all right? Three generations of Abraham's kids later, God puts them on the move again. And this time he says, I want you, he moves them to Egypt. Why? Write this down. God moved his people to Egypt to demonstrate two things, his mobility and his authority. Now watch this. Abraham's people keep growing and growing and growing. What do you mean growing, Pastor Chad? Every one of their wives were fertile myrtle, all right? And every one of them dudes were down to clown all the time, all right? And so they keep on having kids all the time. They have so many kids that they outgrow the nation in which they're staying. And all of a sudden, the Egyptians, they get freaked out. They're like, man, all these people got to do is rise up against us, and they will kill us because there's so many of them. And so they said, instead of kicking them out, they put them to work as slaves, Okay. And so they're sitting there, and for, for 432 years, they're slaves. And they're like, okay, so much for this whole being a blessing to the world thing. Hard to be a blessing to the world whenever the, uh, when you got to make bricks all day, and the guy who, who you're making them for thinks he's God. And all of a sudden, God speaks to a guy by the name of Moses. And he says, Moses, I, you're, I need you to get moving. And I want you to walk up to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. Because I'm about to show the world something absolutely incredible. You see, rem remember something about what God's about to do here. Israel's God was an invisible God. Okay? But Egypt's God, Egypt had all kinds of statues and had all kinds of different gods. Israel had one God who was invisible. Egypt had tons of God and there were statues all over, them, all over the country. And God tells them this. I'm going to whoop every one of those major gods in front of everybody because I'm going to show you that I alone will be worshipped. I alone am in charge of this whole thing. I'm the one running things. Not Ra, the sun god, Jehovah, the god, that, Elohim that created the earth. God wanted to show Israel and Egypt that he could never be confined to a place because Egypt thought that the Egyptian gods only worked in Egypt. And Israel said, you know what? I, I, I kind of only thought that this required for us, uh, work for us. And God said, uh-uh. I'm transportable. I can go anywhere you want me to go. Anywhere I want to go, I'm going to go. 
Now watch this. He said, the earth is my jurisdiction. And sure enough, not only does God whoop every one of those Egyptian gods, here's what's so cool. Nobody ever even has to raise a sword. God whooped them all by himself. Some of us right now, you're in the middle of a battle, and you're trying to fight this by yourself. And if you will give this to God and say, you know what, God, this is now in your hands. I'm backing off, and I'm just going to spend the rest of my time trusting you. God will sit there and say, hot diggity dog. Now watch this. I'm fitting the show out. Here's what we got to understand. When, when Egypt finally let them free, the Israelites took whatever they wanted from the Egyptians. The Bible says that they were made favorably disposed. And so they got all their jewelry. All these Israelites, uh, uh, they're like, hey, uh, do y'all want anything? And they're like, yeah, I want all your gold. I wear the gold at, you know? And it's like, I want that gold. I want your earrings. I want the gold that's in your nose and in your toes. Yeah, I cough it up. This is 432 years of back pay. And what we begin to see is that they plundered the wealthiest nation in the known world and absolutely decimated their economy. God showed them. And showed the world that he was the one that was in charge. And about four and a half months later, God offers this contract up to him. And here's what's so cool about this contract. God said, hey, look, you're not going to make no contract with me. I'm going to make the contract with you because I'm going to define these terms. You don't get to make no contract with me. By the way, the blessings of God in our life and in our church are conditional. We got to keep moving And we got to be able to, you know what, God, what's next? What seed do you need us to sow? Because we are going to be on the move all the time. And here's the thing. God defined the terms. And at Mount Sinai, God said this. If you keep moving, I'll keep blessing. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Bible says Moses went up to God and the Lord called him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt. How do we know that they didn't have to raise a sword? They didn't have to do nothing but obey. And how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the earth is mine, you you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you are to speak to the Israelites. Now watch this. God tells them this. This is is the whole deal. You listen to what I tell you to do? I'm going to bless your life. Crazy bless. And then he tells them what to do. He gives them these ten commandments on these huge stones. Let me read it to you. The first two says this. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God. Who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery? You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth below, in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. And here, what was so cool, they had just seen all this radical deliverance. And they were like, dude, no problem. We just saw what you did to Egypt. We don't want nobody else but you. (laughs) I love what the King James Version says. After they get all the Ten Commandments, the King James Version said, everything the Lord hath said, we will do. (laughs) You know, they're kind of like fired up. Yeah, man. And here's what happens. God tests them. And you know how he tests them? He, he, He tests them to see if they're serious about this because he keeps sending Moses up and down the mountain. To, to kind of give like different more details and everything. What the, hey, I'm, I've given you, you kind of like bold print. Now we're about to go into the fine print. And so Moses, uh, you know, several times is going up and down the mountains carrying these old heavy stones. This week, whenever I was, I was writing, I was like, I bet Moses was shredded. I mean, he's having to walk up and down a mountain with carrying these stones. I bet you had the, the calves of a Greek god, you know. And that's just the way my mind works. But anyway, uh, and, uh, one time, God keeps Moses up there for 40 days. And watch what happens. It says, when the Bible saw that, when the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, come make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us out of Egypt, we don't know what happened to him. And Aaron answered them, take off your gold earrings so that your wives and your sons and your daughters uh, uh, are wearing and bring them to me. Everything that you just got, 
All of your blessings, take it and let's melt it down. Can I, this ain't in your notes, but this is free preaching, okay? Can I let you know something? Whenever you and I do not put God first in our finances, that all the idols in which we trusted will, uh, will turn on us and it will break us down. I learned one thing a long time ago. You're going to pay your 10% tithe somewhere. You may not pay it to a church. You may be paying it to the auto repair. Or you may be paying the, uh, some dude to come in and, and, and uh, redo your washer and dryer and something like that. It pays to be in covenant with God where all your stuff will last longer. That, that's good preaching, Chad. I'm going to amen myself. I'm going to respond to the altar call today. Anyway, it says this. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. And he took what they handed to him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a, with a tool. And then they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. You see, God is still dictating the fine print on that contract. And they're already breaking the first two and most important commandments. I don't know if you, if you like to, to study the Bible very much, but the famed reformer Martin Luther had an incredible insight on the Ten Commandments. He said this. He said, the first two commandments are exceedingly important, which are no other gods before me. You only, got, only worship one God. We don't worship the harvest God. We don't worship the sun God. We worship one God. And here's the other thing. Don't make any idols. He said, you only worship that one God. All right? And what, what Luther suggests here is incredible. He said this. We won't break the other commandments if we don't break the first two said this, that all the other sins are a byproduct of not worshiping the one true God or worshiping another God. And so whenever we read this, we kind of have to, we kinda, I, I remember looking there and saying, why, why are these fools saying that this was the God that brought them out of Egypt? They, they literally watched the God melt the gold down. They literally, they're like, no, dude, there wasn't no cow leading us across uh, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the Red Sea. But here, what happened here? They even see Aaron make the thing. And the reason why we get confused by this is because our whole life, we have, uh, we've grown up our whole life for the most part believing in an invisible, always at the same time, ever-present God. For Israel, this was new territory. You know, they wanted a God that they could see. That what they wanted, they wanted a monument. They wanted a statue. So, so they go over there and Moses and God go nuts. At this, and he's like, okay, you guys just ain't getting it. You guys, we're, we're not even, <laughs> well, you know what? Uh, we're not even into this deal yet, and you've already broken the first two most important rules. So Moses packs everybody up. He's like, we got to get out of here for y'all. Y'all going to cause everybody to get killed. And so he packs them all up. And as they're leaving Sinai, what happens? Moses packs those stone tablets and puts them in a box. And then later on, he builds this, this portable tent. Where that house all that stuff, and as he, as they begin moving, something extraordinary happens. Let me read it to you. It says this: Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent because the cloud had settled on it. The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, and in all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and the fire was in the cloud by night, and in the sight of all the Israelites during their travels. Watch this. The Bible says whenever God wanted them to keep on moving, all of a sudden that cloud would start to move and they were to follow the cloud. The ancient rabbis used to say that when the cloud was moving, that was God's legs walking. And watch this. Sure enough, they get their land and they build houses, but something inside of them and something inside of a lot of Christians, they never stopped wanting that monument. You know? So they're like, okay, we get it. God don't want us to build no idols. And so instead of that, they said, instead of having an idol, we know you're, you're not pro-idol, God. We want a king because that ain't no idol, right? And we want a king because all the cool kids have kings. And we, we want to be like all the cool kids. And so, uh, uh, so they kept on asking and asking. And God gives them a king, and he is bat crap crazy, all right? His, his name is Saul. And by the way, the name Saul in Hebrew means ask. All right, so God gave them what they asked 
four, all right? And so they're in there, and this dude, he had, for 42 years, like, man, I can't believe we asked for this dude. And then God, in his, in his grace and wisdom, gives him a new king who loves him. His name's David. And this guy was a good one, all right? Uh, he went over there, and, uh, and God really liked David. You know why? Because David was always on the move. You know, he was, he was all the time, when he became the king, he was expanding the kingdom. He was killing God's enemies. He's building new stuff and adding on to stuff. David could move, Jack. And so God really, really liked this guy. Later on, the only time that David got in trouble was when David sat still. What do you mean? means he decided he's going to chill out for a little while. Then all of a sudden he takes another man's wife and uh, gets her pregnant. And then all of a sudden he tries to kill the, hu- he kills the husband. All kinds of other stuff like that. And God's like, yeah, yeah you in trouble. But before all that, David has got all these different palaces. Watch, this is so cool. David's in all these palaces, and, it, and the palace was made of cedar and, and stone. Why, why does the Bible say what was important, uh, uh, cedar? Whenever somebody says your house was made of cedar, it means your house smelled good all the time. And so David one night is chilling, and he has this really noble thought. He says this, uh, 2 Samuel 7, 2, he said to Nathan the prophet, he said, here I am. Living in a house of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. He's ticked off. He's got the, the redneck Chad Stafford version is this. Where they're like, dude, I'm living in this baller crib and God has to live like some cub scout in a pup tent. This ain't right, you know? And so it, it messes him up so much that God sends Nathan the prophet to him. And he has this word to him. He's like, he said, this is what the Lord God says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I've not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israels out of Egypt. I've been moving from place to place with, with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers, which I've commanded to shepherd my people, why have you not built me a house of cedar? God's looking at us like, David, thanks, bro, but I'm, I'm cool with living in a tent. I prefer it. I ain't here most of the time anyway. And that tabernacle, that little tent, it all the time needed repair. But, and, and every, but here was the good thing about the tabernacle. It was temporary. God's like, look, I'm not confined. I'm, we ain't going to be here long. And here's the thing. David's palace had cedar and it smelled nice and all these beautiful stones in it. But there was one problem with that, with that house. It was permanent. And God's like, uh-uh, you don't understand me just yet. I am a moving God. And here's the thing that you got to understand about that tabernacle. Write, uh, write this down. The portability... And the temporary nature of the tabernacle was actually the whole point of the tabernacle. Why? Because God likes to be on the move and he always wants his people to be on the move. New buildings are awesome, but only if it keeps us moving in the right direction after people who are far from God. Did you just hear what I said? Let me let you know something, Coastal Church. If you're checking us out, if we're interviewing with you today, let me make sure that you know something early on where you don't get frustrated in the middle of all this. Coastal Church was not designed to be some refrigerator that keeps Christian people from spoiling. Coastal Church was designed at its very inception to be a hospital for people who are lost and hurting and addicted that we can show them the love of Jesus and watch them be set free. This is why we exist. So David just keeps on. He's like, I'm not going to let you go until you let me build that temple, you know. And God's like, okay, you killed too many people. You can't be the one building it. And David goes, can I raise money? He's like, okay, you can raise money. He raises the money. He hires a contractor. He gets the stone cutters and everything like that. And David don't just build a temple. He builds a temple of all temples. You know why? Because he's trying to not only not compete with the Joneses, he's wanting to blow the Joneses out of the water. And 20 years later, that temple's finished. And Solomon, his son, goes, you know, God, will you come here? Will you come and live in here? And what's so cool about God, he answers, he goes, Solomon, I'm going to move in. But I am not committed to staying here. You guys start messing around and because you think I'm tucked away in here. You know what he told Solomon in, in 1 Kings 9? He said, you start messing around with me. This temple will become a heap of rubble. He said, I'm not screwing around here, dude. All, this, this nice building, thank you. That's a nice thought. It's totally cool. He said, but you start messing around. He said, all who pass by will be appalled and will scoff and say, why has the Lord done such a thing to this land and to this temple? So 
Before he goes in, and when he goes in, there's a, I mean, it was awesome. They, they said, man, the temple was filled with smoke and all kind of other stuff like that. It was kind of like whenever, whenever NASA uh, launches up and all of a sudden the smoke down the bottom, everybody said, man, God's living here. But God's like, yeah, I, I'll hang out here, but you better be doing right. God gave Solomon like the, the car keys talk. <laughs> whenever your, your teenager, you know, when they get the car keys and everything like that, look at them. <laughs> My, my dad gave me a stern lecture because he knew his boy was stupid, all right? And, hey, you know, let me tell you something. You screw around with my car, I'll take it. And, and, and God said that same thing to Solomon. He said, yeah, you think you're going to domesticate me? Don't screw around with me. And you know what? Sure enough, Solomon, that talk didn't, uh, didn't stick. Solomon got a little, uh, he got a little sidetracked with what? Women. The Bible says that man had over 700 wives. He was a palaya, all right? That is two, that's enough for two women a day, all right? And so Solomon got a little bit sidetracked. And here's the only problem was is that uh, not only were they women, he married, uh, he married foreign women. You know what foreign women mean? Foreign gods. The Bible says that Solomon had drifted so far away from the plan of God that he even married Pharaoh's daughter. The people that used to keep them in chains, he's going to go and make a covenant with them. So he gets a little bit sidetracked. And, and, and here's the thing. Not only did Solomon build Jehovah a temple, he built a host of other miniature temples. Uh, and, and he worshipped uh, uh, those gods along with his wives. Look at what uh, 1 Kings 11 4 says this. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord, his, his God, as the heart of his father had been. He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. You know why he was detestable? Because he demanded child sacrifice. That's why we speak out whenever those horrible, stupid, pathetic, detestable laws are trying to get passed in New York and Virginia. It's time for the people of God to say, no, we do not worship the God of Molech here. We will not let you stand and say that this is what, where the future is going because you're killing the future. We stand for those who cannot stand for themselves. So we're over here and we see that uh, that the detestable God of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as his father David has done. Once Solomon moved God into a temple, he thought he'd reduce God down to the same level as everybody else. And there was a reminder. There was no reminder that our God is a moving God. And sure enough, in 587 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar gets into Israel through a breach in the wall and he kills thousands, and he enslaves thousands more, and then he goes over and he tears down the, the temple down to its very foundation. Fortunately, God wasn't there because he'd moved out long before them. And then a few years later, King Cyrus comes back, and he makes them, he's like, y'all, y'all need to build your temple again. But here's one little jab that he throws at him. He said, only deal is you got to build it super small now. And whenever the temple got dedicated this time, guess what happened? Whenever it got dedicated, uh, there, the people that were there during Solomon's reign, the Bible said they wept aloud because they said, Dear God, I can't believe we've fallen so low. Do you know why? Because God doesn't bless monuments. He blesses Movements. When you're about following him and moving with him, that's the kind of church that God blesses. He likes, hey, look, he ain't got nothing wrong with buildings. Building, we're going to have to build a bigger one in the days ahead. One, I don't know. But if this, if this church ever ceases to be about people who are far from God, then God will God say, my name's Wes, I ain't in the mess. I ain't going to stay around with that. Jesus comes along. You know one of the reasons why the Pharisees hated him? Because he spoke out against the temple. He looked at him one day, he goes, let me tell you something. You see this temple? There's one greater than the temple. And they were like, the Jewish people went nuts. They were like, what do you mean there's somebody greater than the temple? The temple wasn't the center of their world. The temple was the, temple, was the center of the world. And Jesus goes, there. one day the disciples are bragging on the, on the temple. And he's like, man, Lord, look at these magnificent stones. And Jesus goes, I wouldn't get too excited about it. It's a teardown. And then we begin to see. The heartbeat of Jesus, he's saying, guys, the temple's coming to an end because something greater has come. Why do we say all this today? Let me wrap all this up. 
Because monuments to God always get torn down. The church that God is after, the church that God blesses, the purpose of church is to be a movement where you and I, maybe you got hurt in the church before. I get that. I I understand it. But maybe one of the main reasons why we were so quick to abandon the church is because we never really understood the purpose of a church. The purpose of the church was to come together and seek God and say, God, what's the next step? What, do you, what have you purposed my life to become so that I could be the hands and feet of Jesus to reach a lost and dying world? Folks, the reason why we got to understand the purpose of the church is because the church is needed more desperately than ever before right now. All you got to do is watch the news for 10. I can't watch the news for more than 10 minutes. I'm looking over there and like, thank God this thing's recorded where I can fast forward for this mess. Get to the nice stuff. But one thing I learned a long time ago, good news don't sell. It don't sell newspaper and it, don't, it, don't, it doesn't make your ratings up. But when you and I come together and we realize, you know what? Everything that's frustrated me about this beautiful mess called the church was all because we abandoned the purpose of it. Maybe you're here today and you're looking to be a part of something. Church is not just a a building. Certainly not anywhere close to that. It's a movement. You want to be a part of something? You want to be a part of something that changes people's lives? You want to be a part of something that shows you for the very reason for why you were created? Learn about the church. Be a part of a church. God has such a great plan for our lives. Buildings aren't the church. Buildings are nice, but it's just a box. That's all it is. You know, I remember one time being at work one time, and there was a gal. She got, she'd gotten engaged over the weekend, but she, she didn't want to tell everybody that. She wanted everybody to notice her ring. And so after a while, nobody had noticed what had happened over the weekend. And so finally she yelled out, it's so hot in here, I think I'll take my ring off. You know, and... And here's, she wasn't showing off the box, was she? She was showing off the rock. A church, this building, all it is is a box. You know what the treasure is? You. The beauty of it is the family. The beauty of it is that we get to come together in spirit and in truth and say, God, what have you got for us? Wherever you lead us, we'll follow And that's the type of church that God blesses. That's the type of church that God uses. And that is the church through whom the Gulf Coast will be saved. Would you stand and let's pray. Father, thank you that you help us to understand today this beautiful thing that you've created called the church. Lord, we repent for what we've tried to make it. May we humble ourselves, dream again. Lord, connect with this great thing called the church. Learn about who we are and what we've been created to be. And Lord, help us to do what you're blessing. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. With every head bowed, every eye closed.